Um, my name is Nikita, and I am the director of the Open Society. Today we have six wonderful panelists to provide perspectives from the independent, Republican, and Democrat um, society. And here to introduce the panelists and introduce you to the debate are the President of the Society, Hannah and Leah Edward. Because of our values, and the government shouldn't mandate 
how we can go about providing that information. All right, very good. Um, we just like to request all the panelists to speak up. Um, so there are a lot of people here, and people on the back end, here you guys. Um, so we'll move on to the second question since we seem to all agree on the first. So for the first time since the 1988 election, both candidates and a moderator failed to mention climate change or global warming in any of the three debates. Should combating climate change be a concern with government? If so, how should we do with that? Let's start with Mark here. Let's start with the public use assignment. Uh, well, we recognize the fact that climate change is a big issue to some extent, but the environmental regulations are a lot of the economy is much too quick. Uh, much too quickly enacted. There has to be some environmental regulation that's just there. We're putting on a corporation so early and so quickly it actually damages the way that companies do business. In order to create more jobs in addition, we also have to permit corporations to explore and develop sites for oil and gas going that they've already gotten um, sort of permits for. This has also been stopped by the Obama administration. So while the environmental rights of the planet are extremely uh, important in this election, I think it's important also to make sure that we enter that gradually so that we don't hit the economy. At, at the same time, though, I, environmental issues are something that's important that we're facing. Climate change is a real, pressing national security crisis. And for someone like Mitt Romney to get up and say that we need to encourage clean, well, first of all, tell me what clean coal is. What is, what is clean coal? <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's oxymoron. My I feel that, you know, we need to get our people back to work. We need to get the economy working again. But at the same time, we need to be worried about how to preserve that economy for future generations. So I, I think that there's, I mean, we all agree that the economy, that the environment is very important. Um, but I actually think that lots of Republicans don't really agree with that. Um, last summer, the Republicans tried to pass a rider on a bill that would make it so that the Environmental Protection Agency couldn't list new species as endangered. Now, how, how can you protect new species if you're not allowed to mark them as endangered? Um, also, I think that Obama has, President has done a good job encouraging clean energy um, because energy um, does take up. So, I'm sorry. Um, because uh, electricity and uh, energy is an important part of um, the environmental um, burdens that we're putting. And so uh, by encouraging renewables, uh, we can make our economy more renewable. Yeah, how about I just have a small point and then I'll use going to elaborate. I was just speaking to what David said about uh, last summer, and it is true, Republicans did try to get some new species to not be labeled as endangered. They were actually unsuccessful at that, and that's because uh, we recognize that a lot of the Republicans that we see um, on TV and also a lot of the Democrats we see on TV don't necessarily represent the entire party. Um, news has turned into somewhat of an entertainment industry, and so obviously the radicals and the ones who are most entertaining, so they tend to be the ones who feel a lot of way. I think uh, the real Republican policy on environmental change is not to stop it, because it's sort of foolish to stop sort of regulating uh, the environment. It's, what you really have to do is you have to stop the crop. So uh, Mitt Romney, or Governor Romney, wants to ensure that environmental laws are properly accounted for in the regulatory prices and the to expense. He wants to make sure that companies have more time to come into those regulations, because right now it's hurting the economy. And he wants to cap any new federal agencies that are going to regulate something like that at a zero dollar thing. Because at the point that we've reached, our deficit is too high to keep adding new regulation. They have to happen, but it has to happen slower and a little more cheap. And then it's yeah, so we definitely need to work out this balancing act as a country in, in the next few decades. And I think that Obama has um, has demonstrated a, a sort of an, another approach that we haven't yet addressed. But we have two options when dealing with climate, uh, climate change and regulating how businesses act uh, relative to, uh, to the environment. One is to regulate, and two is to advance. Obama, Obama said, initiatives on creating new jobs and uh, that initiating advances in technology towards a greener future rather than regulating what is already broken. I believe that is the correct direction to uh, take our regulation. That's a nice compromise between uh, growing the economy and Avoid situations like the debacle that happened earlier this term, 
while it was very well intended, and I do believe that President Obama had the best interest of the country in mind, we can't afford to be making a huge investment that just becomes zero like that. The rules. Violence. They fuel all sorts of drug violence. 
and, and it creates a cycle of, of, of you know, societal inequities, frankly. And then they're also, on the other side, there are these massacres, like we saw in Aurora, like we saw in Columbine, like we saw at Virginia Tech. The fact that I can go on the internet and purchase a gun like it's some sort of painting, that, that disconcerts me. Because if you look at how um, the guns were purchased by the person who shot, um, who conducted the massacre in Aurora, most of those weapons were purchased over the internet. It's very frightening. Just, yeah. just kind of Judy's point, when it comes to gun control, I feel like there are two components to it. There are legally sold guns, and then guns obtained illegally. And I believe that we don't need any more tragedies like the recent one in Wisconsin. If we're going to prevent those from happening again, we need to combat the illegal arms trade. That has to be done in the government. And at the same time, we should restrict who can buy or who can buy um, weapons legally and how many like weapons can be even bought legally. I believe that the Second Amendment, Amendment like Junius and David, is obsolete, unnecessary at this point in time, and only permits violence in a country that we do not need to see anymore, especially after this summer of too many killings. All right, thank you, Gabby. Uh, because of time constraints, we're going to have to move on. Sorry, Mark. Don't do the three dog eyes. It doesn't work. Uh, I love you, Mark. <laughs> thank you. So we move on to Obamacare. Um, Obamacare is structurally similar to Romneycare, a plan Romney is, quote, very proud of. Uh, <laughs> furthermore, an individual mandate was originally conserved with idea. How can Romney impose a program so similar to his own? How would he reform American health care? In reference to uh, Romney's quote about obstruction of health care, that was made at a time when he was actually governor of Massachusetts, and that's actually in line with his policy, which is getting health care back to the states. Every state has a very different demographic and a very different situation, and to impose one health care plan on the entire country is fundamentally wrong. When Romney was governor of Massachusetts, that was the right thing to do, and it worked, and he was proud of it. But to put that on a national level is inconsistent and not very efficient. So I think that. What Governor Romney would say, what I would say, is you need to get that back to the states, let them continue, and also get that back to the private companies. 54% of people in this country are employed outside of large corporations. Some of those are insurance brokers. If you get private companies back in the market, that can create more jobs, more competition, and create more efficient health care. Yes, I agree. One health care plan for the entire country is wrong, and nowhere in the long term. In fact, Obamacare opens his arms to the states and says, if you can do it better, if you have a better plan, please show it to us. We'll let you do it. If it's more efficient, if it gets people coverage, if it has a minimum standard of coverage for everybody, do it. Please do it, because it's better than our plan and we want everyone to get health care. That is why Obamacare is one of the best pieces of legislation that's come out of this administration, because it balances all the goals and regulations that health care reform needs, while also providing the freedom that the Republicans have about uh, about uh, for individuals. By the way, Greg's, Greg's opinion is not necessarily indicative of the whole All right, And I would just like to emphasize the stakes in this election for students like us when it comes to health Obamacare extends our parents' health care coverage until we're 26, which is critical when we get out of college and for future We need Obamacare as students and the younger generation to be feel safe about our health in the future. There's a lot at stake for students like us, especially involving health care. Uh, Malky. Well, I understand that uh, national health care and Obamacare, even if they can vote it, is an attractive concept that everybody's going to have health care, you know, has outside of college when they're older. That's a very attractive concept. The problem is the economics. Again, we come back to this. The country is in a crisis. We're approaching a fiscal cliff. The budget is enormous. Obamacare is costing right now $95 billion, and that has to be paid for with taxes. Why you can say we're just going to increase taxes on the upper class, on the upper sort of poor pile of the tax income, that's not going to cover it. That's not enough. You can't make the entire economy stronger by suppressing one part. So while I do understand that it is an attractive concept, I just don't think that we can pay for it at this point. Julius. There are two main issues with Obamacare that I think. One of them is the sort of constitutional and, and moral aspect suggesting that if you don't purchase this product, if you don't buy into this government plan, we will penalize you. And if someone doesn't want to buy health insurance, it shouldn't be a necessity that they do so. It shouldn't, because, you know, you often make the analogy between car insurance 
and gold insurance, but that, that's, that's different in that you choose to have a car, you choose to have a home, you don't choose to have a personal body, and that personal body should not have to be regulated by the government in terms of being, you know, subsidized or insured by this plan that you might not necessarily need for long. Yeah, got it. So recently in the New York Times, Nicholas Kristof wrote an op-ed about his friend who had decided not to purchase his own health care and ended up regretting it deeply later on when he was diagnosed with cancer. And this cancer could have been diagnosed earlier if he did have a health care plan that forced him to have checkups and to make sure he was healthy all around. We need something like Obamacare to make sure that um, American citizens can have checkups and engage in the preventative measures needed to avoid committing to diseases like cancer. Obamacare saves lives, and I feel like we really have to take that into account. There are economic aspects to it, I'm sure, but I think the idea of saving lives is more important than maintaining an extremely prosperous economy. Okay, uh, in the concern time, we're going to move on to the economy and the budget. Okay, so uh, the federal budget deficit for fiscal year 2012 was $1.1 trillion. The national debt is $16.2 trillion, or 102% of GDP. The United States has only passed the 100% mark twice in its history, after World War II and now. How should the United States government cut its expenditure? Name three specific programs that you would like to cut. Let's go down the board. Yeah. First, he wants to repeal Obamacare, which has savings of $95 million. He wants to privatize Amtrak, which is going to have savings of, these are approximations, $1.6 million. He wants to reduce subsidies for the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities for $600 million, and reduce foreign aid for $100 million. The reason uh, between behind that is why are we borrowing money from foreign countries to give back to other foreign countries? While I understand that it's humanitarian cause, and I support it, I think at the current time, cutting money is the, first, is the most important part. And then again, uh, you will align the federal employee compensation plans with the private sector. Right now, the public ones are 30 to 40 percent higher, which doesn't really make sense. That's around 47 billion dollars of savings. Now, if you add up all these savings, very piecemeal, it comes to about 214 billion dollars. Now, that's an incredible amount. If we could cut that, that would be a great start. To start. To start it. Also, we need to in institute Romney's tax plan. If we institute that, we can encourage the economy to grow. Independence or liberals? Must be liberals. So, okay. So we currently spend seven hundred billion dollars a year on defense spending. That's around twenty percent of all of our expenditures. Uh, you know, a few months ago, uh, the army said to Congress, "Please, we have enough tanks. We don't want any, want any more tanks." You know, Congress said to you, said to them, "Too bad, we're going to get more tanks." There are literally tanks sitting in warehouses right now, rotting and collecting cobwebs. Okay, defense spending. Uh, second, the loopholes. I actually give Romney credit for this one. Romney um, has enacted quite, uh, uh, quite a good um, plan of regulating uh, the loopholes within the tax code in, uh, uh, as his time of governor in Massachusetts. Uh, he's had a lot of pushbacks from companies, but he's been really strong on that point. I think I'd like to see more from, from him if uh, he does get elected president. Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the Medicare system as it is needs a lot of of drastic cutting if you want to preserve it uh, for future generations. There was. Uh, well, we agree with Greg in that um, the defense budget we think is massively um, over large, and we think that Mr. Romney is going to be increasing it unduly. Right now, our military is, I think I've heard, strong enough to take on the next 20 countries' militaries. Uh, if it came to a war, so us versus 20 of them, and I think 19 of them are actually our allies. So um, I think that just points to the fact that we have a military that's so large that we don't um, need all of it. We have uh, another... Um, and I feel like instead of cutting government programs, we can increase the revenue that the, government's collect, the government collects by increasing taxes on the wealth. We have billionaires like Warren Buffett saying, tax me, I have so much money, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> And the government could take that money in and pay for so many important programs, like social programs and health care. And we need just to tax the wealthy because they have enough money already. On top of this, this, uh, this tax issue kind of brings into like, um, this thing we like to call compromise. Um, we, uh, 
in our, the way our government works, we all have to work together, um, and we have a certain party, I'm going to name them, they're the Republicans, who are refusing to compromise when it comes to tax. Um, uh, the 112th Congress, I think every single Republican congressman, one except for six, um, signed through over Norquist's pledge not to raise taxes. And I think that just points to uh, closed-mindedness and unwilling to compromise on their side of the aisle. We're in a congressional gridlock, and that's preventing any change. All right, okay, um, Matthew. Um, just sort of to address that, um, we're not only talking about cutting programs, first of all. You can also, there's a study that says reducing waste and fraud in the U.S. government would account for $60 million of savings alone. If you make cuts like that, just sort of shaving things off instead of completely cutting programs, that can sort of stand for itself. Also, when you said that the wealthy are asking to be taxed, the highest percentile that's going to be taxed larger in Obama's tax rates from 28 to 35 percent it's not people over a billion dollars, it's people over 200,000. Those people aren't asking to be taxed 35%. In fact, if you do that, it will seriously limit their economic opportunity. So I don't think you can say the wealthier are asking to be taxed, because the definition of wealth here is over $200,000, and that's unfair. And I'd like to add to that, um, I think Warren Buffett is a funny example, but I think it actually lacks in the, um, in the event that when you have over $20 billion, there is no difference in standard living if you have $5 billion or $50 billion. There's no, there's no uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Gabby. Before you decide whether someone has enough money or not, whether they have enough money that, you know, they, they, it, it doesn't matter. Like, who are you to decide um, how much prosperity someone has? I mean, the winds of Savannah are blowing in Europe, they're not blowing in mine. And I feel that. <laughs> Thank you. 
all you can right. do is either of you really address the justification of spending that much, just simply the ability to pay for it and the fact that both sides are willing to pay for it doesn't really justify paying for it, the, the actual paying for it itself. Um, really, we do not need the amount of spending that we are spending on military spending. Um, the Germany or not, um, largest you know, superpower in the world or not, the world police or not, we do not need to be spending the levels we are spending. I mean, um, I think you mentioned this, but we own 20 out of 32 aircraft carriers in the world. We have maybe, what, 5% of the population or 50% of the military spending, something like that. That's just simply not unnecessary. Okay, to move on um, to the unemployment rate. In a report called The Job Impact of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Plan, the Obama administration forecasted a 5.7% unemployment rate for May 2012. It is now October 2012, and the unemployment rate is 7.8%, which accounts for people um, who, which does not account for people who are looking for work but are unable to find it. If you consider that group, the unemployment rate is 14.5%. Has the administration's stimulus plan failed? And if so, does Obama deserve another four years in office? David? Yeah, well, if we're going to start off with just saying, has the stimulus plan failed? Um, 12 out of 15 studies said that it worked. Um, so uh, that can answer that part of the question. And uh, to move on to the jobs question, right here, I know you can't see it, um, but this is a chart of unemployment, um, or employment, sorry, change in employment for each month. And, uh, and if you go down here, and this is the end of President Bush's presidency, and right here is where Obama became president. And I don't know if you see, it goes uh, pretty much up from there. Um, we also have, uh, depending on the which source you're going to trust, I had one person who told me it was 30. I'm going to use the more conservative source. We've had 24 months of straight job growth. Um, so that also speaks to improvement. It's not as fast as we would have liked, true, but I think it's uh, it's got an and I think he does serve another four years as president. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say some of those statistics don't account for the fact that some of that raise in employment is actually people dropping out of the workforce, so your pool becomes smaller. And also, I think in the last month, there has actually been a couple months, about a small decrease. There has been a small decrease. Also, I think the reason for this is that companies aren't really people, and individuals too aren't being given enough economic leeway to do what they want. I mentioned this statistic before, 54% of all private sector workers are outside of big corporations. Mitt Romney wants to cut the marginal tax on them by 20%. If you have more economic needs, you're more likely to start a small business or go into some sort of industry. Also, right now the US economy is suffering from a 35% COVID tax rate. That's pretty much one of the highest in the industrial world. The, uh, I think the developing country average is 25%. If you take that down and build three up companies to employ more people, open new plants, and stimulate the economy. The independents are liberals want to answer? Um, look, addressing the 35% on uh, the big companies uh, tax rate, I mean, that's what the tax rate is on paper, but in reality, it's quite much, the effective tax rate is lower. Mining companies pay on average 18%. I think the closest to 35% any other industry pays is um, construction at 31%. But in any case, um, I don't think high tax, but the current tax rates on corporations are stopping innovation. And secondly, um, None of us are economists up here. Um, we don't exactly, we can't exactly tell you whether or not the stimulus plan has worked or not. There are arguments that say the economy would be worse if the stimulus plan was not enacted. Fair enough. But in any case, we have to come to the understanding that the president himself has very little control over the economy. Sure, he can encourage Congress to pass a stimulus package, but really, a lot of the average voters these days seem to think that the president has two handles in front of him, one set the economy, one set gas prices. Really, that's not how it works. <laughs> so, really, what we should be talking about a lot is, uh, I think we should veer the discussion away from his specific economic um, if, if I can answer that As far as the bailout goes, I think that, Yes, in the short term, both the bank bailout and the auto bailout could have ameliorated some of the effects of, um, of that negative growth, of you know, unemployment, of recession, etc. But I think that in the long term, that, that sort of Keynesian economic model of continuous bailing out, of continuous government subsidization, 
that, that doesn't work. Mitt Romney, in an article, um, poorly titled, Let Detroit Go Bankrupt, whoever, whoever buys on that needs to be fired. But he said that without that bailout, Detroit will need to drastically restructure itself. And I would argue that without all these bailouts, America will drastically need to restructure itself. All right, David, we'll let you come back right in, but we want to throw something else in here. Um, the U.S., according to an OECD PISA study, the U.S. is ranked 17th in the world in reading, 12th in mathematics, and 14th in science. The military budget is six times the education budget. Do you think there's a need for reallocation of funds? Gabby? Of course I think there needs to be a reallocation of funds. It's just absolutely absurd that we spend so much on our defense and I'm compromising academic skills of our own students by just making, by spending all of our money on texts that we simply just don't need. And there's just a gross misprioritization of what we're spending our money on. And we can't blame that on the president. We have to blame that on a gridlock Congress that is currently unable to get anything done because everybody just refuses to reach across the aisle. So, also, if you think about it in terms of security, the military gives us uh, military security, yes, but then if you look at economic security and how Americans compete in the global economy, um, unless we have our students um, and our kids getting higher levels of education and getting to be in the higher ranks, um, 12, it's not acceptable to me. So we got to spend more money on our education so we can compete more effectively in the world. There it is. I think it's important to say also that um, just in, in sort of that respect, competition with the world, the real problem a lot of it is that we do have educated students. A lot of businesses with their educated employees are leaving America because it's hard to compete here. Corporate taxes are too high, individual taxes are too high. In addition, I think it's important to remember that when Romney brought in his education plan in Massachusetts, he did reach across the aisle. He did actually get it to have some of the best education rates in America. So I think we should really trust that to him. Certainly. Um, in his last debate, Mitt Romney mentioned that he wanted to set up um, an immigration policy that helps keep the education within the United States. So when you get your diploma, with your college diploma, you're automatically handed the U.S. citizenship. I totally agree with that. Yeah, we absolutely need to spend more money on education when it comes down to that. Okay, we're going to move on to foreign policy right now. In an interconnected world of terrorism, drone strikes, and nuclear weapons, does the U.S. have a responsibility to intervene to prevent tyranny wherever it may flourish or only when obvious U.S. interests are at stake? Do we have a question? Yeah. The question again? Okay. Um, does the U.S. have a responsibility to intervene to prevent tyranny wherever it may flourish or only when obvious U.S. interests are involved? Yeah. I think uh, the United States in particular, the president has a very hard line to walk because he's got to, on one hand, balance the safety and security of American citizens, but on the other hand, uphold the values which we as a country um, believe in, such as democracy. So I think that Obama, uh, President Obama, has done a good job at um, walking that line because he has taken, in my uh, mind, the right action. But he's done it in a multilateral way with our allies across the world. So it's not just the United States being the world police, but if it is, it's the world um, as a group, if we can, um, agreeing on something. So like Libya, we went into Libya um, with NATO, and we um, helped get rid of uh, Gaddafi. Um, and so I think that was the right action with Syria. I think it's good also that he hasn't done anything with Syria, because the world has been we haven't been able to come to an agreement with our allies on what should be done there. And I think that anything we do, we need to do um, with other countries. We can't just go and do our own thing. Yes, Mark? America has been intervening in, excuse me, intervening in all of the huge that, um, that was a little poorly said, let me just start. <laughs> America has been intervening historically for the last 200 years in everything foreign that possibly proposes a threat to itself. And so, at this point at least, for Iran, Syria, and Libya, it's our almost responsibility to continue to intervene and try to help these countries to establish this kind of like our system of democracy. And both Romney and Obama have agreed that it is terrifying that Iran should possibly acquire a nuclear weapon in the near future, or possibly already does. And we have to agree with what Paul Ryan has said recently, that we do not want boots on the ground unless it does propose a threat to America directly. 
Yes, Julian. The fact that we have been intervening in so many conflicts is a problem in and of itself. Hence Afghanistan, hence Iraq, hence coups all over the world, hence et cetera, et cetera. I think that the notion of American exceptionalism should have died out a very long time ago because frankly, if you look at our human rights record, if you look at our um, corrupt practices, we're not that nice anyway. I think that America as the largest country militarily, I think that it does have a certain role to play in terms of steering other countries and gathering its allies together to form cohesive units, like at the UN, like through NATO. I think the best interventions that we've um, engaged in thus far have been in Libya with NATO, in Somalia with um, NATO and some of our European allies. So I think that's the multilateral multilateralist direction we need to take. Yes, Malachi. I think it's important to clarify that you referenced the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I'll again reiterate that we're saying no wars, no boots on the ground, unless America collapses a threat. Paul Ryan said it, and I'll say it again. However, America has always had a commitment to the world to prevent humanitarian tragedy, the loss of life. I think that no fly zones, missile strikes, if they are sanctioned, should actually continue. Because if we don't do it, we will. The UN has been proven to be somewhat ineffective. And the other major powers that have an interest in international relations are Russia and China. If you leave it in their hands, I'm a little afraid about what's going to happen. So I would say, you need to keep intervening, but do not start another war. Do not put boots on the ground, unless American lives are at stake. That's the problem. I'll get right to you, David, but before that, again, we're going to throw something in. Since assuming office in 2009, Barack Obama's administration has escalated targeted killings using UAVs. More CIA drone attacks have been conducted under President Obama than under George W. Bush. Drone strikes are estimated to kill high-level terrorist targets only 2% of the time. Um, conservative estimates say that 3,000 innocent civilians have been killed by drone strikes in the Obama's presidency. 174 of them children. Isn't Obama's policy on drone strikes detrimental to American policy in the region? And shouldn't the United States call drone strikes in the Middle East? Let's start with liberals. Um, drones. Yeah, um, Obama, uh, President Obama has used drones more than any other president. Um, and They've had their, uh, they've had successes, and they've had a lot of, um, they've killed a lot of innocent people. So I personally am not a big fan of his use of drones. Um, I think that they have killed high-level targets, um, but I think that in the long run they're doing more damage to the American uh, reputation across the globe. Which actually isn't to say that's bad. Um, if we want to talk about American reputation. Uh, we can look at this, right? Sorry, it's a little small. There's a lot of people um, these. Oh, sorry, these dark lines right here. These are different countries, all right. And these dark lines show how much um, they like President Obama versus how much they like Romney. Um, so, um, there's, there's 21 countries on here, or 22. Sorry, 21 of them um, say that they like Obama significantly more than uh, Romney, and one of them doesn't. That's Pakistan. <laughs> This is a BBC poll. Twenty-two thousand people were uh, were interviewed. Kind of like old, I guess. Is the term. Um, so the drones haven't helped our world image, and that leads to anti-American sentiment, especially in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, but I think, on the whole, um, Obama has done a pretty good job in terms of getting the popular support for the United States around the world. Sorry, yeah, Malcolm. Um, I don't think it's really right to say that Obama has done a good job in garnering support if that involves killing children and innocents in the Middle East. While I do support in American intervention, we use in terms of missiles, I think lately we've been firing them off really nilly at anything that moves. I mean, it really looks good to kill high-level terrorists, and we understand that. However, if you're going to kill innocent people, you can't do that. It has to be much more tactical than that. And also, on the approval ratings of Obama in the rest of the world, I'm assuming a lot of those, I haven't seen the graph, I'm assuming some of those are European countries. Some of them are. Uh, uh, that South is a region. Africa, Europe, Africa, and then, uh, that, yeah. a region, that is a region that has lately tended toward a more socialist approach to government, so it wouldn't make sense if the uh, approval ratings were Obama higher. Yeah. However, I do think that it is a better uh, representation of America if we use the more controlled Romney plan for more thing. Greg. Back to the original topic. Um, <laughs> Jones in the air or guns are from the hands. You know, this is warfare. That's what happens when you wage wars, when you intervene militarily, and you start targeting high-level, uh, specific high-level um, operatives in uh, 
certain organizations. <coughs> there will be civilian deaths. We take the, those civilian death numbers and we slap the word drones on them. And the fact that there is no, no person banning those specific drones physically in the air, that somehow changes the perspective for a lot of people. However, this is warfare. Whether it be drones or someone with a gun, this is how war is waged. So, if anything, I hope it gives you gives the world and our the country a new perspective on war in general. But specifically for drones, you can use drones and as you can use soldiers responsibly and irresponsibly, and those need to be judged on a case by case basis. During his campaign for the U.S. Senate and governorship. Romney said he would preserve and protect women's access to abortion. However, since 2005, he has identified himself as pro-life. How can Americans choose a candidate who can't make up his mind on an issue? Conservatives? <laughs> 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 Well, it is in front, but uh, 
uh, point. I do actually believe that a couple should be able to be married. I also think that this is a question that should be again relegated to the states because the states that are more in tune with their demographic, the more in tune with what their demographic wants. If we put that in their hands, we we'll probably have a happier country guys. There's no reason to. And the government, the national government, should tell everybody in the country what to do. Leave that in the hands of the states. They can decide it in a better way. Well, I'm sorry, but as of now, the government is telling everyone what to do by not allowing same-sex couples to marry. It's saying that marriage is between a man and a woman and nothing else. And without allowing people of other sexual orientations to marry each other, that is government intervention, of course. That is government regulation, of course. That is all the things that conservatives and Republicans themselves condemn. So I think that we really need to evaluate that before we make a decision. Okay, uh, we've been talking about medical issues, so we'd like to transition to Medicare. In 2012, entitlements accounted for 62% of total federal spending. Three major programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, soak up about 44% of the national budget. All three programs are growing faster than inflation and when joined with $1.7 trillion in new Obamacare spending will drain about 18.5% of the nation's total economic output by mid-century. Entitlement programs have been the golden cow of the Democratic Party since FDR. How do you justify having entitlement spending at this level? David? Um, well, one, so yes, there has been a massive increase in entitlement spending over the last four years, and we need to ask ourselves why that is, um, and there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the baby boomer generation, um, the generation of people born after World War II, are now uh, now coming to the age where they start receiving their social security benefits. And so clearly there's a lot of them. Um, it's the largest generation of Americans ever. And, uh, and so they're taking out a lot of money, money though that they had put their whole lives into the system. So there's no way that you can say they don't deserve that money. Um, also, people will say that um, Obama is making it more clear that people can get entitlements and he has, he has been making it easier for them, but he has been making it more well known. Um, and uh, and I just wanted to make a point that uh, John Stewart made a couple weeks ago, where um, when a corporation takes advantage of corporate loopholes, that's being a good businessman. When someone who's entitled to welfare takes advantage of that welfare and actually uses it, uh, that's called mooching off the system. And so that's just a little bit of a double side to that we've seen in the rhetoric that I think should address. Okay. I think it's also important to address the Democratic side of this issue. Um, this is really a very, very poor time in the American economy to try and increase government spending. I made that point again and again, and I don't know how much I can stress it. We literally cannot afford to increase that kind of thing. It doesn't matter how strong Social Security is. If the economy is so bad that we can't support anything through taxes, if people have so little money that you can't tax out of them to support Medicare or Social Security, then you've got a whole other problem. Also, the Obama administration's policy with Medicare in relation to Obamacare is actually very easy. Well, I know that Obama is made this but Obama actually is going to take $716 billion from future spending for Medicare and reallocate it to Obamacare in addition to $500 billion within the next couple of years. I think that if we're going to address entitlement spending, we should definitely make it look consistent, but we shouldn't sort of play this game where we reallocate money and sort of pretend that it's going yeah, to come out of the system. Greg? To address that last number, the 700 billion coming out of Medicare isn't the most straight up cuts. They're actually uh, planned organized savings to save waste. And that's where the 700 billion comes from. There's not a penny of delivery cuts that have an absolute value to Medicare. If anything, it makes them more efficient. But anyway, answering the, the question on the more general world, entitlement spending at this level is there because it needs to be. It just has to be. That structural there is nothing wrong with the philosophy behind it. Uh, we need these social programs to provide that safety net and provide a minimum income for some people who have to do That is the standard of something that we have to do a certain in our lives. However, of course, at these levels, it really shows um, specific conditions that we are working at right now that are putting strain on the system. And that's where reform needs to come. That's where the conversation needs to go to privatization of social security, things like that. We need to sit down and reform. reform how the programs themselves they should be there to stay. I'd just like to talk to the point that Malcolm made, which is that we don't have enough money to spend. And I agree with him completely, and I just think we should cut it from uh, the military. If we look back at um, 
the grand scheme of things is the military shops keep us safe, right? But if people like the United States, then, uh, then we can actually uh, protect American security with much less spending. Um, so I'm going back to foreign policy a little, um, because I think Obama's just done such a stellar job. But uh, he's just worked um, for peace and security around the world. And I think that'll actually help us with their economic costs back home. If you look at um, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty that he signed with Russia, um, he's worked for peace with what uh, Mr. Romney would call, or has called, our greatest geopolitical um, adversary. Um, so I just think that uh, he's opened up relations with Cuba. He's, uh, he's put huge economic sanctions on Iran um, that have actually brought their economy to its knees and brought them to the table to talk about ending their nuclear ambitions. Um, I think that is actually through the international um, foreign policy we can help fix our problems back home. Yes. Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, those, those wins of command are really over spring. Um, but, I, but I feel that when you have a national debt as high as it is, when you have expenditure spending as high as it is, and when you have average Americans who simply cannot afford to keep paying more and more and more and more. That's the national security crisis. If, if hypothetically, if the rest of the world likes us as much as you say it does, what about our own citizens? Do they like the direction that this government is taking? In that, Medicare and Social Security will not be sustainable for future generations. Look around. All, all of us in this room, when we're 60 years old, we're going to be the ones paying for this legacy of debt, for this legacy of entitlement, for this legacy of the government distributing money freely without any regard to thinking of the future, without investing it in things like education, without investing it in things like um, uh, helping children and, and helping, um, helping many other groups. I just feel that the direction that Medicare and entitlement brings us into is one that we're going to look back on and regret. You don't think I care about education? I'm not, I'm not saying that. Where, where are we going to come and spend it from people who pay? <laughs> mean, there are a lot of states that pay social security tax and wants to just say, no, you can't have that. I know if the system does have to reform. Well, it's, 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 but, it's less that. You're right. Defense spending needs to be cut. Entitlement spending needs to be cut. Both sides need to come to the realization that they can't have it their way completely. That's, that's the reality we have to face. If we want to keep this country running, we have to make sure that we can work with each other to make cuts across the entire board. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you for going to address what you said before about the all the dealings with Trump and Russia in specific. I don't know if you guys remember this sort of big story, but at a moment when you thought that it might have turned off from G20, Obama told the major man that was the time the president, after this election, I'll have more flexibility to deal with you. That's not a direction that we want to take. Uh, well, I do think that we do want to get better relations with Russia, better relations with China, because that's an economic net that can really prove to be very, very helpful to us. Telling the president in sort of a sort of sneaky way that we're going to have more leniency without telling your constituency what exactly that is is a little underhand. And I don't like the fact that the president can do that without such repercussions. We need to stay strong in our negotiations. We need to agree, but we need to keep a firm point and say, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to agree on this, but we're not going to back down. All right, thank you, Matthew. Now we'd like to open the floor to uh, the audience. Any questions you guys have, feel free to sign up over here and ask. Uh, yes, gentlemen, whose hand is in the air.
or not to cut, but to reform um, the United States' spending. Um, but just if we look at generally, first of all, I think that the direction that Obama tends towards is much more in line with my personal views than the one that um, Mitt Romney would be. Um, also, I think it's been very hard for President Obama to work with a, uh, a Congress, a Republican Congress that has sworn to um, oppose his moves. If you look at what the uh, Senate Majority or Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said in 2010, their number one goal wouldn't be uh, to help the country or to you know fix our problems, but it was rather to get Obama out of office. Um, so when you have people like that, when you have last summer the, the debt ceiling crisis, um, when you have uh, Eric Cantor, Congressman Eric Cantor, walking out of the White House and refusing to talk to the President of the United States, that basic lack of respect and unwillingness to compromise can be hard to uh, work with. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, sure. Congressman Cantor, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so this is for the Republicans. Um, so Mr. Chairman, I have asked Dean Myers.